Good evening, everyone. I'm Molly Young from the Miami University Alumni Association. As part of the Objects That Changed the World lecture series organized by the Miami University Humanities Center and the Miami University Alumni Association, today we present The Pill with Kimberly Hamlin. Kimberly Hamlin is professor of history. Her most recent book, Free Thinker, Sex, Suffrage, and the Extraordinary Life of Helen Hamilton Gardner, published by W.W. W. Norton, tells the fascinating story of the fallen woman who reinvented herself and became the most potent factor in congressional passage of the 19th Amendment and the highest ranking woman in federal government. This project received both the National Endowment for the Humanities Public Scholar Award and the Carrie Chap. Carrie Chapman Cat Award for Research on Women in Politics. She writes frequently for the Washington Post, and most recently, you can also read Kimberly's work in Chronicle of Higher Ed Essay, Why Are There So Few Women Full Professors? In the Miss Magazine Essay, What the Historian Wants Her Own Kids to Know About Women's History Month, and the Fast Company Essay about her hashtag Me Too class. Just so our viewers know, questions were collected during registration and Dr. Hamlin will address some of those throughout the webinar today. You'll also have the option to ask a question during the webinar by clicking the ask a question button at the bottom of your screen. Please note that in the interest of time we may have available, we may not get to every question. Today's webinar will last about an hour, including those time for questions and answers. Please welcome Dr. Kimberly Hamlin, and thank you for taking the time to join us today. Thank you so much, Molly, for that nice introduction, and thanks for JJ for making sure we're all set tonight, and also so many thanks to the Miami University Humanities Center for organizing this fantastic lecture series and for being such a big part of my life at Miami and supporting so many um, wonderful programs that support faculty, students, research, bringing in outside researchers. Um, I think the Humanities Center is one of the very best things about Miami University, so I'm delighted to participate in this event today. So as Molly said, I am Professor of History and American Studies at Miami. This means I teach um, a, a wide array of courses, and most frequently I teach courses on women's history, the history of sex and gender, history of medicine, um, and last fall I taught a new class called Me Too, A Cultural History. So that's sort of the my range of teaching in addition to various other introductory classes and capstones and whatnot. Um, and my research centers on the history of women and women's rights in the US with a sort of sideline in history of medicine. So that's uh, why I selected the pill as my object that changed the world. Also, I'm very happy to be here on March 31st, the last day of Women's History Month, which I love hate, as you can read about in the um, Ms. Magazine essay that Molly mentioned. And I'm gonna make the controversial claim now you can discuss it with me uh, during the question and answer period, but I'm gonna make the claim that no object has changed women's lives more than the birth control pill. It is the only medicine so well known that it goes by the name of the pill. For more than 50 years, it has been the most prescribed medication in the world. So tonight we'll discuss the history of the pill, uh, some of the controversies surrounding it, and why it is my object that changed the world. So I'm gonna share my screen now so we can also look at some images. To understand why I selected the pill as my object that changed the world, we first have to understand what the world was like before the pill. We don't have time this evening to go back to the beginning of time, but please trust me when I say that women have always been seeking out and trying to control reproduction. We can talk about the pre-19th century things in the Q&A if you would like, but today I'm gonna start with what the world was like before the pill beginning in 1800 in the United States. The U.S. fertility rate in 1800, as you can see here, was about seven live births per woman. That was the average. So now to give birth seven times 
As you surely know, this means most women were pregnant many more than seven times. Also, this graph does not indicate the high rate of maternal death and infant mortality in the US throughout the 19th century. Women knew that to be pregnant was a risky, generally life-threatening enterprise for themselves and for their children. So that's the first thing I want us to think about when we imagine what life was like for women before the birth control pill. And here I'm focusing again, mostly on the 19th century for now. If a woman didn't herself um, have a difficult childbirth, she surely knew friends, neighbors, sisters who did. The rate was approximately one out of um, every 100 women, women would have died in childbirth. So you knew of or knew a woman who had died in childbirth. So now our second question we might think about would be, given this, um, given this reality of the dangers of childbirth and, and infant mortality, we can also see here on this graph the this precipitous drop um, from just about seven babies per woman in, in 1800 to um, just over three when we get to 1900. We might ask. Kimberly, I'm so sorry to interrupt, but the, there's a sharing notification on the bottom that's blocking some of the dates. So just so oh, our, no. our viewers get the full picture. Oh, okay. I don't know um, what to do about that. Let me see if I can move it. Thank you so much for letting me know. You're welcome. My apologies for interrupting. That's no, I'm again. so glad you did. Let's see. And if not, you can just narrate around it. Okay, I will um, do my best. Oh, I see this one right here, right? Yes. Thank you. Okay, so by 1900, the fertility rate drops closer um, to three just over three and then we get um, to two by 1940 when it steps back up. So this is an important part of our story. So before the birth control pill, you might be asking what accounts for this steep decline, right? Um, and what were, what were women's options? So I'm gonna share a few images and let me apologize in advance that some of these images are rather harrowing if you imagine um, how they might have been used. So, uh, the first is a 19th century syringe. One of the more popular methods of birth control in the 19th century was douching, whereby women would inject various uh, lotions and potions and chemicals in the hopes of preventing pregnancy. So that's method number one. Method number two is um, a thinly veiled category of not very effective medications called female pills. We see these advertised in all sorts of 19th century periodicals, newspapers, magazines. These were two of the more popular brands. We see Pierce's Penny Royal tablets. That was um, a well-known abortive fashion. Uh, I'm not saying it was effective, but that's a, something that women turn to in the hopes of preventing or ending pregnancy, along with the one next door to it, Welch's female pills. So these were sort of clandestinely advertised variety of um, homeopathic potions that women would ingest in the hopes of preventing or controlling uh, pregnancy. Another option, as you can surely see here what this is, this is a Civil War condom, Civil War era condom. Condoms have been around since time immorium, but when Charles Goodyear invented vulcanized rubber in the 1830s, this made condoms much more widely available on both sides of the Atlantic. However, condom use was very much frowned upon. It was considered something used only with prostitutes and to prevent venereal disease, not so much pregnancy. So this was not a birth control method um, available to or popular among middle class or married women. It was something to do on the sly uh, when you visited a prostitute. Another 19th century birth control method was known as a pessary. This was a, this right here is a solid gold, as you can see here, pessary that women would insert it with some sort of sponge, ideally to pre prevent uh, contraception, but you can imagine the effectiveness and the pain involved in this method. 
the most commonly used method uh, was coitus interruptus, or what we call the withdrawal method. Now, as my uh, high school sex ed teacher told us, what do we call people who practice the withdrawal method? We call those people parents, <laughs> because this is also not the most common method of, or the most effective method of contraception. Another popular 19th century method of contraception was the rhythm method. However, this was totally not effective because scientists did not figure out when women ovulated until the 1920s. In fact, in the 19th century, medical advice books told women that the safest time to have intercourse was about 14 days after their last menstrual cycle, which we know today is exactly the opposite time of when you'd wanna be having intercourse if you were hoping to prevent contraception. So from this kind of quick and visual study of 19th century contraceptive methods, a few themes arise, right? Few of these are effective, most are very ineffective, and most of these methods involve male, male participation and or male consent, making them less available to women if they are available at all. So another problem that we don't really have time to talk about today, but that is makes an important context for our discussions of what reproduction, what sex was like for women before the birth control pill is syphilis. Syphilis and gonorrhea were the most common infectious diseases of the 19th century, more than all other infectious diseases combined. So this also frames women's experiences of sex in the 19th century before the advent of penicillin in the 1940s. So it may come as no surprise to you that in this era, this 19th century, early 20th century era, there was a broad and brisk traffic in undercover underground abortions. This is an, a compilation of ads taken from a variety of newspapers, advertising a variety of abortive fashions. And you can see here at the bottom, I'll move the stream yard thing, the Madame Restel ad. She was a noted New York City abortionist. So women had few options, most of which were not safe, many of which were unsafe, even to the point of being deadly. At the time in the 19th century, women also had no right to say no to their husbands. The idea that men naturally wanted to have regular sex, whereas women would not have been interested in sex, is pervasive throughout the 19th century. Female reformers railed against the sexual double standard, but it was very ingrained that sex was a wifely duty, that women were not supposed to enjoy it, uh, but they were supposed to submit without question. So one of the first ways in which we see women begin to argue for a some semblance of reproductive autonomy is the late 19th century push for what women's rights activists called voluntary motherhood. By that, they simply meant the right to say no to their husbands and the right to time pregnancies, you know, two, three years apart in a way in which they would be safer for women. But even asking for such a small modicum of control was very controversial and not necessarily, um, you know, ex widely accepted. Further complicating women's efforts to control their own reproductive lives is the efforts of this man, Anthony Comstock. Anthony Comstock is what's known as a moral reformer or an anti-vice crusader. He was really active in New York City in the 1860s and 1870s, and he was very concerned about the huge influx of young unmarried people who moved into the big cities after the Civil War. Previously, young people had mostly lived at home until marriage. Their courtship, their early uh, premarital years had been tightly monitored by parents, neighbors, family members. But when they moved to the city in record numbers in the late 19th century, who was watching them? Who was chaperoning them? What were they doing out in these mixed public spaces Anthony Comstock wanted to know? 
He was especially concerned about publications such as the one here pictured next to him, the New York Sporting Whip, which frequently advertised birth control methods, thinly veiled references to sex and even abortion. He sought to outlaw such publications and he did so with a vengeance. So he first um, partners with the YMCA, the Young Men's Christian Association of New York, and passes statewide anti-obscenity codes. And then he takes his efforts to the federal level. And in 1873, he succeeds in convincing Congress to pass what are now known as the Comstock Laws after him. And I'm gonna share the text of this with you and bear with me for a minute while I read this aloud. If we were in one of my classes, I would ask one of you to read it aloud because it is so, um, in depth and so capacious of what is covered in the Comstock laws that I think it's it's wise for us to take a moment to look at them in detail because that really sets the scene for much of the rest of our story about the birth control pill. So this is um, taken from the congressional record. Uh, so it's listing specifically what the Comstock law covers. And we will see here that it bars any efforts to sell, lend, give away, in any manner exhibit, offer to sell, to lend or give away, or in any manner exhibit, or shall otherwise publish or offer to publish in any manner, or shall possess for any such purpose or purposes any obscene book, pamphlet, paper, writing, advertisement, circular, print, picture, drawing, or other representation, figure, or image on, or paper, or other material, or any cast, instrument, or other article of an immoral nature, or any drug or medicine, or any article, whatever, for the prevention of conception, or for causing unlawful abortion, or shall advertise the same for sale, or shall write or print or cause to be written or printed any card, circular, book, pamphlet, advertisement, or notice of any kind stating when, where, how, or of whom, or by what means any of the articles in this section herein before mentioned can be purchased or obtained, or shall manufacture, draw, or print, or in any wise make of any such articles shall be deemed guilty of a misdemeanor and a conviction thereof in any court of the United States um, on and on will be convicted and imprisoned at hard labor in the penitentiary for not less than six months nor more than five years and fined not less than $100 or more than $2,000. I mean, wow, <laughs> that is such a broad ranging law, right? Covering basically even thinking about talking about birth control. So the Comstock laws squash any efforts by women to discuss, disseminate, share, even simply publish basic reproductive anatomy books, right? Just the simple fact of knowing how your body works, how our babies made becomes illegal under Comstock. And who decides what is immoral? Comstock himself he becomes appointed inspector general of the U.S. Postal Service, where he basically decides what is considered immoral. So this is the sort of law that women are up against now for nearly 100 years. The effects of the Comstock law are immediate, as we see a huge clampdown in the sort of clandestine advertisements I showed you earlier, the thinly veiled references to pills that help restore your menstrual flow, right? These all become dangerous territory under Comstock. At the same time, the late 19th century is when we see male gynecologists firmly wrest control of female reproductive medicine from midwives. And it's also when we see abortion criminalized in all states by the 1880s. Previously, abortion before quickening, which means when you can feel the baby move, was not illegal, but it becomes illegal as male gynecologists take over from midwives by the 1880s. Now, 
Um, this doesn't mean that discussion of birth control or female reproductive autonomy goes away. It still exists, of course. It just becomes even more clandestine and even more fringe. One of the few places where women and men were openly discussing birth control and or female reproductive autonomy were free thought and free love publications such as this one. My personal favorite, Lucifer the Lightbearer. <laughs> Has there ever been a more evocative name for a newspaper? I don't know. So we still see women and men discussing birth control, but it becomes much more rare, much more underground, and constantly under threat of prosecution, as the publishers of Lucifer the Lightbearer were, by Anthony Comstock. Also, you might be wondering, what about women? Did women's rights advocates advocate or push for birth control? Not really, for a couple of reasons. One, they couldn't really even articulate a universe in which women were supposed to engage in non-reproductive sex. They had been so taught that it was not a thing for women to enjoy. And second of all, they did not want to um, empower men to visit prostitutes even more. Women in the 19th century imagined that if birth control were, were, were more widely accessible, it would be used mainly by prostitutes, thereby further encouraging their husbands, sons, brothers to frequent prostitutes. What female reformers in the 19th century pushed for instead was a single sexual standard, meaning to hold men to the same standard of sexual morality as women, not for women uh, to behave as men. That was what they pushed for. They also pushed for voluntary motherhood. Should any female reformers wa had wanted to talk more openly about birth control, they would have been scared away by cautionary tales such as that of Victoria Woodhull. Victoria Woodhull is the first woman to run for president in the United States. She ran in 1872 uh, with Frederick Douglass as her vice president on the Equal Rights Party platform. Victoria Woodhull became famous first as the first female stockbroker. This made her very rich. So she started her own newspaper with her sister called Woodhall and Claflin's Weekly. She then became the first woman to testify before Congress when she argued that women were already enfranchised under the newly ratified 14th and 15th Amendments, which um, extended the franchise to black men and clarified the rights of citizenship. So she argued, as did other women after her, that because women were citizens, must be they too could vote. This was not what the Supreme Court thought as they ruled in 1875, Minor v. Happer said that citizenship does not equal voting rights. But that's how Victoria Woodhull came to prominence and that's what inspired her to run for president in 1872. But Victoria Woodhull was also a free thinker and a free lover. She's from um, Homer, Ohio. And when she was just a teenager, she was born to a, a, a unusual family who sent Victoria Woodhull, who was known to be an excellent clairvoyant, you know, spiritualist mind reader, out to tell fortunes at a young age. And this is what the family used uh, to sustain themselves financially. So her parents married her off when she was 15 to an alcoholic man nearly twice her age. This, um, as you might imagine, raises questions for Victoria Woodhull about the so-called sanctity of marriage. So she becomes a critic of traditional marriage. She ends up divorcing her husband and critiquing traditional marriage as she goes on to take additional lovers. So she's a free thinker and a free lover. And when she runs for president, this is how the press characterizes her. And this really irks Victoria Woodhull because she knows that men are constantly not faithful, having sex before marriage, after marriage, extramarital sex. And she knows furthermore that the most popular man in America, the Reverend Henry Ward Beecher, the brother of Harriet Beecher Stowe, has been having an affair with one of his parishioners. So she can't take this sort of double standard that Henry Ward Beecher, this minister, is having an affair while she's being mocked in the press. So she publishes the details of Henry Ward Beecher's affair in her newspaper. What does this lead to? This leads to Victoria Woodhull's arrest 
under the Comstock laws. She is arrested simply for writing about the affair someone else was having. So Victoria Woodhull, the first woman to run for president, spends the election night of 1872 in a New York City jail. This has a chilling effect, as you might imagine, on other women who might have thought or felt the urge to speak more openly against the sexual double standard or in favor of female reproductive autonomy. So I wanna pause here because this is sort of part one of my talk. What was life like before the birth control pill for women? And that is part one. Part two will be when we get to the birth control pill and the development thereof. But now I wanna see, do we have any questions, comments, concerns thus far? We do have a couple of questions. Let's okay. see. So Cray asks, um, and he I think is, um, springboarding off the, the dangerous methods of birth control at the time. And he asked, didn't it make some sense to crack down on the advertisement, the distribution, uh, sort of all the things that go along with um, getting it out there to, to people who would use it? Yes. I mean, sure. You can see that they were not necessarily safe. Some were safer than others, but that was not Comstock's goal. <laughs> that was not his stated mission. He did not embark on this mission with the health of women in mind. He embarked on this mission uh, with the sense of protecting young people in the cities. He did not, he was very much concerned about premarital sex and the virtuousness of um, marriage. So, and he expressly targeted women who were promoting safe, effective forms of birth control and even just knowledge of female anatomy. Excellent. Okay, that makes good sense. Um, let's see. Zoe asks, did these Comstock laws also apply to pornography at the time? Yes. Yes. So the, the reach of the pro, of the Comstock laws is wide. Um, in in many ways, he was targeting what we would consider today, like obviously pornography. But as that's why I wanted to read that ridiculously long bill, right? To see like he's targeting everything and anything that remotely mentions sex or birth control. So yes, pornography, but also even simple pamphlets like what you should know about your body pamphlets would be targeted under Comstock. So basically he, that language I think was designed to meet all, all four yes. corners anything. of everything. Yes, education yes. included, yes. So I have a question. This is my own personal question. So yeah. you mentioned um, Lucifer and the light bearer and yes. you, you specifically mentioned men and women yeah. having dialogue as it relates to Lucifer and the light bearer. So were there any men seeing as women, you know, didn't feel empowered to verbalize or, um, yes. you know, articulate? Was there any yes. ally we had? Yes. Sort of. So there were some uh, men in the free love movement, uh, which was a fringe and small 19th century movement. But um, there were some men in that movement who did articulate kind of the pain, horrors and fear associated both with pregnancy, unintended pregnancy, frequent pregnancy and what that must entail for women. And so people like John Humphrey Noyes, who founded a utopian community, argued what he called male continence meaning withdrawal. And so he said, this is what men should do. This is the safer way to think about and practice sex. Also, um, the man who founded the Battle Creek Sanitarium in Michigan, Kellogg, the inventor of the cornflake, he also had a lot of ideas about male continence. Sylvester Graham, inventor of the Graham cracker, he was another one of these kind of quirky 19th century reformers. And his impetus for the Graham cracker in his it was, and he also advocated a vegetarian diet, was he thought that eating bland food would kind of quell male lust. So he did this out of an urge to kind of, you know, keep the male lust at bay and, um, you know, allow women sort of a break from frequent intercourse with their husbands. So that is the background of the graham cracker. It was not uh, initially a vehicle for s'mores. It was supposed to be like a bland, healthy brown bread. Well, that's an interesting fact. <laughs> I will forever reflect on a s'more differently. There you that's go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and we have one more question that yeah. came in. Um, let's see. Um, 
we have a question from Ron here, and he yeah. wants to know how Woodhull was able to get a divorce. Granted, the era, you know, was restrictive of of divorce and, and women not having any rights. Victoria Woodhull had a lot of money. Um, so she was the clairvoyant to Cornelius Vanderbilt, who oh. was one of those 19th century, you know, magnets and so he paid her well that's and he set her and her sister up with their own new york city brokerage so that helped also she didn't really care about stigma and she after she got divorced she still lived with her husband um he he lived with her in her mansion and that was what brought up these charges of free love because she was living also with her new lover. And the reason she explained that she kept the ex-husband around is that he was the parent to their child. So it was an unusual setup, but brought her a great um, degree of national scrutiny and outrage. Oh, I'm, I'm sure, yeah. I'm sure <laughs> considering her, her various other works and yes. really only amplified um, the scrutiny. Okay, yes. well, I think that's all we have for now. And okay. just before your screens come back up, I actually, I, it's hard to read from where I am, but I think you can click hide on yes, that little I saw that. Yes. message. Yes. Okay, cool. Cool. So all right. Really awesome, thank you. Okay. okay, so part two, the birth part control pill. Oopsie. Um, okay, so what brings birth control back to the forefront are the efforts of these two women, Margaret Sanger pictured on the left and Mary Ware Dennett on the right. We're gonna start with Mary Ware Dennett because she is lesser known. Mary Ware Dennett started off life as a suffrage activist. She was the secretary of the National American Woman Suffrage Association or NASA, that's the main uh, group of suffragists but she parted ways with Nassau in 1914 and turned her attention to birth control. She had become interested in birth control after hearing Margaret Sanger give a talk about it in New York City. Mary Ware Dennett published a pamphlet called The Sex Side of Life, which she intended to be for her two sons. She wrote it for her two sons, but then shared it with a wider audience. And birth control really resonated with her as a cause because she had nearly died giving birth to her third son who did die um, as a result of, their dif of the difficult childbirth. She went on to found the American Birth Control League and the Voluntary Parenthood League. Mary Ware Dennett's approach to birth control centered free speech and reproductive autonomy. She thought the best way forward would be a straight repeal of the Comstock laws but she and her vision of birth control were undone by her fiercely competitive rival, Margaret Sanger, pictured here on the left. So this Mary Ware Dennett's vision of birth control is sort of the path not taken. We might reflect upon this in the end uh, during questions. What would things have been like if Mary Ware Dennett's vision of birth control had succeeded? But instead we have Margaret Sanger uh, Margaret Sanger was born to a free thinking, meaning agnostic or atheist father, and an Irish Catholic mother in upstate New York. Margaret Sanger's mother had 18 pregnancies and 11 live births, and she died at just 50, which Margaret Sanger always attributed to the toll these 18 pregnancies and 11 births had taken on her body. So it was Margaret Sanger's kind of first initial impulse for birth control. She then trained and worked as a nurse on the Lower East Side of New York, where she, she said she was most commonly called in to deal with patients suffering the effects of self-induced or back alley abortions. She recounted the tale of sort of the epiphany case, the case of Sadie Sachs, a patient who Margaret Sanger was called to attend to after a botched home abortion attempt. She cures or helps Sadie Sachs recover, but three months later, she's called to Sadie Sachs' apartment again, only to find her dead after a second uh, botched abortion attempt. Sadie Sachs had told her doctor that she could not possibly have any more children, and she also found it impossible to uh, resist her husband, and her doctor told her, just tell your husband to sleep on the roof. So Margaret Sanger began writing a column about birth control in a socialist newspaper, and she coined the term birth control in 1914. 
She opened the first birth control clinic in 1916. This was the predecessor of Planned Parenthood. She immediately was arrested for violating various components of the Comstock law, and she fled the country for England. She returned to the U.S. even more determined than ever to make birth control a national priority. She devotes the rest of her life to developing, promoting, and circulating a birth control method that women could control themselves. To do so, she decides to partner with male doctors. This is where she parts ways with Mary Ware Dennett. Margaret Sanger thought the most expedient, most efficient way to attain this sort of birth control method she desired, which she described as a magic pill, would be to partner with doctors in the medical establishment. This also leads her to participate in the very popular at the time population control movement, and in some cases to attend eugenics conferences. We'll also return to that issue. She was not really a strong proponent of those ideas. She did so strategically in the hopes of making birth control seem acceptable to mainstream Americans. Margaret Sanger was deeply frustrated that in the past 100 years since the advent of balkanized rubber, there had basically been no gains made in terms of effective contraceptives. And to drive this point home, I just wanna show you this one ad uh, for Lysol. Lysol, as you may or may not know, was frequently advertised to women as a douche they could use to kill germs, as you see here, a concentrated germ killer but which women knew, and you can see from the text, by germ, they meant sperm. So this was basically what women had on offer up until the 1940s. Margaret Sanger thought this was an abomination and she wanted to make sure that there was a birth control method women could control themselves. One of the problems with condoms, obviously, is that you need a man to wear one. She wanted a pill that, or a method that women could use discreetly with or without male knowledge and control themselves. So in the late 1940s, she partners with her friend, Catherine Dexter McCormick. And they, at this time, uh, Catherine Dexter McCormick is in her 70s, Margaret Sanger is 68. And they determine that before they die, they are going to make it possible for women to control their reproductive lives. This is a picture of young Catherine McCormick uh, when she was a suffragist in the 1910s. She was also one of the first women to graduate from MIT. So she has the advantage of being a scientist too. She majors in biology at MIT. Shortly after graduation, she married the heir to the International Harvester Company who was worth millions. But two years into their marriage in the 1910s, Catherine McCormick's husband was diagnosed with schizophrenia. Concerned that it was hereditary, Catherine McCormick vowed never to have children. When her husband died in 1947, Catherine McCormick gained control of his $15 million fortune. So she rings up Margaret Sanger and she says, let's do this thing. Together, they enlist the help of this guy, Gregory Pincus. Margaret Sanger began meeting with him in 1950. She brought Catherine McCormick along in 1953, whereupon Catherine McCormick took out her checkbook and wrote Pincus a check for $40,000. Who was Gregory Pincus? He was an expert on mammalian reproduction. He had started his career as a promising uh, professor at Harvard, but he became infamous in the 1930s for successfully um, fertilizing rabbits in vitro. This doomed his once promising career. And when McCormick and Sanger approached him, he was working on the fringes of respectable science at an uh, outfit he had founded called the Worcester Foundation for Experimental Biology, where he did double duty as a janitor to save money. Within weeks though, Pincus had successfully proven that progesterone limits ovulation. At this point, Catherine McCormick moves from, Sam from California back east to supervise and kind of expedite the development of the birth control pill. Pincus then reaches out to John Rock, a noted fertility specialist also in Massachusetts. John Rock was a devout Catholic, a daily attender of mass, a father of five who kept a crucifix above his desk. He firmly believed that the birth control pill would accord with the church's mandate against artificial checks on conception. 
He thought the pill simply perfected the rhythm method, which the church had approved in 1936. In fact, John Rock had opened a rhythm method clinic in Boston shortly after this church decree of 1936. John Rock was so sure that the church would approve the birth control pill if they only understood how it worked, that he engineered it to mirror the rhythm method. So the reason why the birth control pill was three weeks on, one week off, is because John Rock thought this would appease the Catholic church. There is no medical, no physiological reason why the pill should be that way. John Rock made it so because he was seeking the approval of the Catholic church. This instead gives women on the pill a whopping dose of hormones that they would not have had. This slide is captioned John Rock's error. That's the title of a New Yorker essay by Malcolm Gladwell of the same uh, about this issue of John Rock's desire to appease the Catholic Church. As you already know, um, the Catholic Church opposes the birth control pill and John Rock was devastated by this. He became deeply depressed for the rest of his life and never went to church again. But uh, to, back to our story of the birth control pill, John Rock and Gregory Pincus, with the support of Sanger and Catherine McCormick, successfully developed the pill within a few years. John Rock starts experimenting on his patients in Massachusetts, and in 1956, they take the pill um, in a large-scale trial in Puerto Rico, where Puerto Rican women, against their, uh, without their consent and without their really even knowing, were given doses of the birth control pill. In 1957, G.D. Searle approved the pill Enovid uh, to regulate menstrual cycles with the prevention of pregnancy listed as a side effect. Word got around that this side effect was really the main deal. Less than two years later, more than 500,000 women were taking the pill, but not without risk and harm. Women in the Puerto Rican trials had become sick. Several had died because the first pill had a walloping dose of progesterone and estrogen. So overnight, Enovid becomes one of the most prescribed medicines in America, even as women are becoming sick and dying. At the same time, in 1965, Griswold v. Connecticut becomes a Supreme Court case that finally, after almost 100 years, overturns the Comstock laws. In Griswold v. Connecticut, the Supreme Court ruled the Comstock laws in all their various statewide iterations were unconstitutional because they violated a right to marital privacy, although several justices expressed concerns about grounding this right in privacy, as we'll see in a second. Margaret Sanger died the very next year in 1966, and Catherine McCormick died in 1967 after realizing their lifelong goals of producing a magic pill for women. In 1969, feminist journalist Barbara Seaman published an expose about the health risks of the newly approved birth control pill, approved in 1960 for the express purpose of preventing contraception. <clears throat> Members of Congress were concerned about the findings that, that Barbara Seaman published in her book, so they convened hearings in 1970 to discuss the safety of these early birth control pills. But guess how many women were invited to testify before this all-male congressional panel? 0.0. .0. So in many ways, these discussions about the early pill also give rise to the women's health movement, most uh, famously popularized by the publication in 1973 of Our Bodies, Ourselves. So the legacy of this pill is immense and tremendous. Some of the ways we see the birth control pill talked about today in 1920 is the night in 1920 or in 2020, sorry, in 2020, the New York Planned Parenthood affiliate removed Margaret Sanger's name from its marquee building. They said out of a public commitment to reckon with its founders harmful connections to the eugenics movement. We might talk about this decision. We might talk about the legacy of Margaret Sanger. Another 2020 ramification or element of the birth control pill we might think about is Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, may she rest in peace, um, her disagreement, her concern that the arguments in Griswold v. Connecticut, which provide the precursor to Roe v. Wade, ground women's reproductive autonomy in privacy. 
Justice Ginsburg thought a more secure path would be to make a 14th Amendment claim based on equality instead of privacy. We might discuss that ramification. Regardless of what you think of how the pill came to be legal, it is still today the most uh, effective, most commonly used birth control method by women around the world. 14% of American women aged 14, 15 to 49 currently take the pill, and globally it remains the most popular form of birth control pill as a result of birth control. As a result of the birth control pill, women comprise the majority of college students. Women have been able to successfully plan the number of children they have and have entered careers and professions and jobs in all walks of life in all realms of society. So that is why I, has, I have picked the birth control pill as my object that changed the world. I look forward to your questions and comments. Thank you. Thanks, Kimberly. So we do have some questions. Let's see. All right. We had several kind of come in here just in the last few minutes. Okay. okay. So let's see. Um, you didn't necessarily touch on this too much. Um, and I think this person may know more than the average viewer. Um, <laughs> she asked, how did Victoria Woodhull wind up becoming a eugenicist, even though she advocated for free love and, and seemingly progressive views? Oh, Margaret Sanger was the one I mentioned becoming a eugenicist. Victoria Woodhull moves to England um, oh. afterwards. So I, I don't know if he means Victoria Woodhull in later life or if he, if the viewer uh, means Margaret Sanger. But Margaret Sanger um, attended some eugenics conferences and corresponded with eugenicists in the effort to because eugenics in the 1920s, 1930s was a very popular among scientists, widely accepted movement. And so she thought if I hitch my uh, wagon to this train, birth control too might become acceptable. Okay, all right, let's see. Um, this one is from Liz, she asks, what was the larger cultural reception of John Humphrey Noya's ideas about male um, continents outside of the folks who belong to the Oneida perfectionist group? Yes, um, not highly received, <laughs> not, not well received. So that was, uh, I brought up noise in answer to the question about did men support, you know, reproductive autonomy for women? And yes, there are some examples and he was one that came to mind, but he was by no means mainstream or representative of the norm. Okay. There also were some male physicians that um, did advocate for a more capacious view of female reproductive autonomy, like Abraham Jacoby, who was the husband of Mary Putnam Jacoby, the fi pioneering female physician. So there were some voices um, of male allies, I guess, in these early years. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah. Um, let's see. Um, Raj asked, you know much about the development of the IUD. Was that out of necessity? Was that out of just um, the idea for something different? How is that relatable? Um, I would encourage people to check out the work uh, by my friend um, Liz Watson, who wrote a book about the IUD. So I don't know as much about the development of the book, but I know, uh, or the development of the IUD, but I know the historian who does. Um, and there is a fantastic book that she has written about its history. Excellent. Okay. Hopefully our, our viewers will check that out. Let's see. Um, this question comes from Chelsea. She first says, hello, Dr. Hamlin. And she also asks, how could the ERA, if passed, impact the pill oh, okay. <laughs> and the women's health movement overall? I think that's an excellent question. I didn't hear the first part. Could you oh. say that again? How did the what? Yes. She said, how could the ERA, if passed, um, impact the pill and women's health movement overall? Oh no, I don't know if that's my bad connection or yours. ERA, ERA. You are how frozen. Can I, oh, am I frozen? Uh-oh. Am I frozen? You're not frozen. Am I frozen? Oh no. Molly, it's frozen. Am I frozen? You're not frozen. JJ, 
<laughs> maybe maybe our tech support okay. can hop on. And, uh, are we can better? We put the question maybe? from Chelsea in the chat. I got something yeah. about women's health. Okay. Yes, one okay. moment. It's a good question. Okay. Okay, there you go. Hopefully I can switch my good. internet connection too if mine is spotty. Oh, how could the ERA, if passed, impact the will? Pill? Oh, okay. Um, yes, Molly, that is a good question. <laughs> um, so I think the ERA, if passed, would impact access to the pill and not so much the weeper. Um, you asked about the women's health movement, but I would say women's reproductive autonomy because it would remove barriers to women's access, right? So one of the things brought up all the time is how insurance companies cover Viagra, right? But not in many cases, birth control. So that is one thing that I think the ERA would kind of as a blanket measure address. Um, and so one thing we might also think about is that since 2011, states have enacted a record number of walloping, broad ranging, um, restrictions on women's reproductive autonomy. So how does that impact our story, right? Um, and we also might think about Margaret Sanger's choice to hitch her wagon, so to speak, with medicine and why women need a prescription for the pill, right? So there's many avenues or many forms of uh, birth control, like condoms that are available over the counter, but the birth control pill is not. In some places, plan B, the so-called morning after pill is. In some states, it's less available. So that's another aspect of sort of the medical uh, role in this debate about women's reproductive autonomy and birth control. Excellent. That, that's a great answer. So we have a couple questions um, from a couple yeah. different folks that are um, very much the same. So why okay. have you changed this week of placebo pills? Um, oh my God you know, since it was sort of to the Catholic church. <laughs> yes, I really, um, I want to uh, recommend that you read this John Rock's Error article by Malcolm Gladwell. Another source that I really recommend you read is a New York Times photo essay or image essay by another friend of mine, Lauren McIver Thompson, called Women Have Always Had Abortions. Um, and that's where some of the images I drew from tonight came from. So, um, in answer to the specific question about the placebo week, there are now some newer forms of the birth control pill, right? Where you take it three months at a time before you have a month off where you will ovulate and have your period. But those I think only became the norm in like the past 10, 15 years. So in the interim, there was this large like 40 year time when this three weeks on one week off was the norm. And I just think that is a fascinating element of this history, right? That in an effort to convince a group of ostensibly celibate male virgins that the pill was the way to go, that's why we have the pill the way it is. Wow. Right, right. And, and still. Patriarchy in a nutshell right there, I think. Absolutely. I think you could <laughs> have stated it any better. That is perfect. Um, okay. And I know we're, we have a hard stop. Um, in a few minutes. One last yeah. question. Okay. Um, let's see. Um, this comes from Cray as well. What do you think about the push for a male birth control pill to put the responsibility of birth control sort of back on men? Do you find that to be a good idea? Are there pitfalls? What are your thoughts? Yes. I mean, well, Margaret Sanger, if you asked her and people did, she said, and Catherine McCormick too, they did not push for a male pill because they had a deep distrust of men and they really wanted something that women could control themselves. So sure, is a male birth control pill, you know, would that be a good thing? Probably. Um, but would that meet Margaret Sanger and Catherine Dexter McCormick's push for something that women could control themselves? No, right? If women are to be reproductively autonomous, it needs to be something that women can control. Although um, that said, the hormonal aspects of the birth control pill, right, is a question, right? That's a lot of, of hormone messing around that women do in between the ages of 15 and 49, when 14% of American women are on the pill, right? For many, in many cases, years at a time. So I think it's a mixed bag, depending on if you're privileging health or autonomy. 
Absolutely. I, I agree. I, I had this feeling you were going to take it that direction, but I wanted to ask just, yeah. just from the expert here. Um, well, thank you so much, Dr. Hamlin. We are so pleased that you could join us. My pleasure. Um, that's all the time we have for today, unfortunately. But thank you again for leading us in this webinar this evening. And as a reminder to our viewers, um, we have a we will have a recording of this presentation available on our website soon. Um, to learn more about the important work of the Humanity Center here at Miami and other lectures in this series, please go to humanitycenter.miamioh.edu. You can donate and become a friend of the humanities by going to give to Miami oh.org slash humanity center and please be sure to check out our other new and archived webinar presentations at alumlc.org slash miami oh thank you all for joining us this evening and love and honor to you thanks everybody